recently I, I read a, a book by, it's about, gonna come out in September actually, by uh, Yoram Hazoni over mm-hmm. at the Herzl Institute. And he, he's a very big proponent of nationalism. Uh, and the reason that he's a proponent of nationalism and not just patriotism is he says that there are these set of customs and histories that play into the, the creation of the tribe and to simply kind of intellectualize tribalism to, well, I agree with you on this list of propositions, therefore we are not part of the same tribe, ignores the fact that people have a natural inclination to identify with people who have a similar history, a similar culture, a similar language. What do you make of that argument? Is there any way to bridge that particular gap? So my, my standard analogy about all this is that Every poison is determined by the dose, right? And so nationalism is a little bit like salt. A pinch brings the meal together. It, it combines all the flavors well. It brings out the flavors. Um, it really sells the dish. A little too much, it ruins the dish. Way too much, it's literally toxic. And so I'm with Roger Scruton. I haven't read this. You know, I, I don't have the connections you do. So I haven't, <laughs> I haven't, gotten, the, I haven't gotten the bootleg copy of this book yet, but... Um, I have absolutely no problem with the arguments from people like my colleague Rich Lowry or from, from Roger Scruton that a little nationalism is essential. Um, you need some sort of sense of social solidarity and cultural affiliation that binds you together. My problem is, is that if you listen to uh, Raihan Salam or, or Rich, this, this idea of, na- of a politics of national unity to me is much more problematic because when you say that the highest ideal is not, not patriotism, which is basically a creedal idea, right? And there's, there's a certain set of propositions that we agree on, but it's instead this sort of far more mystic idea. I mean, Ryan and Rich and Yoram are probably, I would think, in fairness, not ethno-nationalists, right? They're not saying that only one ethnicity or true Americans or true Israelis or any of that kind of mm-hmm. stuff, right? But nationalism becomes very difficult to define, particularly in a multi-ethnic society, where there isn't an enormous amount of consensus around customs. And it turns out that the consensus is around the creedal stuff, not the, the, cult, the weird cultural stuff. And so manufacturing this sort of national, this, this concept of nationalism, I think very quickly becomes exclusionary to a lot of people. It will certainly be seen as exclusionary by a lot of people. But what concerns me more is getting, it's sort of getting back to this microcosm versus macrocosm stuff. The government in Washington or the central government is the only institution that has any claim of speaking for the whole nation. And so almost invariably, when political parties who have control of government take up the mantle of nationalism, it becomes, a, it becomes either socialism or some other form of statism. And one of the, it's weird, there's this vestigial thing from Marxism that still teaches people that socialism and nationalism are opposites, which is a fight that the Trotskyites lost in the Soviet Union in about 1926. They're not opposites. They're far more often the same thing. Read a speech by Fidel Castro. Read a speech by Hugo Chavez and replace every instance of the word socialist with nationalist and every instance of the word nationalism with socialism. It doesn't change the meaning of any of the sentences. When you nationalize an industry, you're socializing an industry. Nationalized healthcare is socialized medicine. So part of my problem with nationalism is that if you want to put teeth on the bones uh, teeth on the bones, that's not right. If you want to put flesh on the bones, uh, that's the cold medicine kicking in. If you want to put flesh on the bones on a nationalist program, the only way to do it is by having some sort of large federal and federal government endeavor. So that's part of my problem with it. I also, you know, it's also just worth pointing out that, that people think that nationalism is this ancient thing. It's also a product of romanticism. It, it first comes out uh, more or less in Germany as a response to the imposition first by the French Revolutionary Army and then by the Napoleonic Army of the Enlightenment, which was seen as a foreign French import. And so these guys like Johann Ficht and Johann Herder create these mythical notions of German national identity as a response to all that. And so ethno-nationalism is, is, is a fairly modern concept. There have always been countries but this idea of national, nationalism is a fairly recent thing, and it is, in its origins, inseparable from ethno-nationalism. I think now you have a sort of, you can have a civic nationalism. Actually, Rousseau is very good on civic nationalism. Well, he also wants a totalitarian state with, with the general will, but, that, but <laughs> that you know, one, one thing at a time, you know. Um, and so I, I, it just makes me nervous. I, I think the founding, I, I very much want to flip the pyramid. I think that... Um, I want to send as much power down the most local level possible because when you do that, only the issues that really do unite us all 
will become federal issues or national issues, right? So abortion will probably rise to the top because it gets to the very question of who's a human being. Slavery rose to the top because it gets to the question of who's a human being. But beyond a couple of those kinds of things, push everything else down to the most local level possible. The Founding Fathers argued, you know, in essentials, unity, in everything else, liberty. And the I don't understand, no one's been able to explain to me how a program of nationalism isn't also a program of centralizing and federal government empowerment. And I'm open to arguments, but I know, and Ramesh has made one point to me that, you know, some trade stuff could be, you know, like getting out of the Paris Accords, so both populist and nationalist, but also not centralizing. So there, I, I'm open to the possibility that there are more it's examples. from of, centralization outside the United States. That's yeah, right. I mean, it was a pullback from the globalists, right? But in general, uh, I, I think the internal logic of a nationalist program that emphasizes it rather than using it as sort of a background flavor with a pinch of salt invariably or has a danger of turning of sliding into sort of top-down government again. So one- 